and it's on. All right, we are in Ezra chapter 3 tonight. Dennis told me that he uh, got through chapter 2 on Sunday. And uh, so before we begin, we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll get right into the text. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you for this day that you have blessed us with and for the many gifts that we have in our lives. We pray, Father, for those who are not able to be here tonight. We pray for Dennis and hope that he will get well. And for Joe and Grethel, we pray for their health as well, that they will get well. Um, We also pray, Father, on behalf of those who are struggling with various difficulties in their life. We pray for Allegro, who is grieving at this time, and for many others who have, for whatever reason, they have some difficulty in their lives. We pray that you'll help us in this study, Father, as we read your your word and we read the scriptures, that we will come to a greater familiarity with you, with your will for our lives, and with the kind of people you want us to be. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. We are in Ezra, and we are in Ezra chapter 3. Alright, so chapter 1, it was uh, Cyrus issued the decree that said that the people could go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple and their city. And uh, then they went back to Jerusalem under the leadership of someone named Shesh Bazar. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel are the same person or two different people. And uh, you know, I was looking at that issue some today, and you know, I think my view might change on it sometime soon. We're not sure yet. We'll we'll see. Um, I really shouldn't take anything I say about it as gospel until I've come, settled down on something. And even then, you shouldn't. You should study and come to your own conclusion. But. Uh, Ezra chapter 2 is a very, very long list of people who came back. Uh, I assume that uh, you all analyzed each and every one of these names and numbers in exquisite detail in Dennis's class on Sunday. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a list of names and numbers. It's one of those chapters you kind of go, well, okay, this isn't the most edifying thing in the world. Um, were there any loose ends in that chapter that needed to be covered, or are we pretty much good on Ezra 2? I think we're pretty much good on Ezra 2. Ezra chapter 3 now, we're coming more back to the narrative of how they are uh, rebuilding the temple. And really here from chapters 3 through the end of chapter 6 is all about how the temple gets rebuilt. So, you know, at the beginning of chapter 2, it said that uh, these people, they had gone each to his city. But in chapter 3, verse 1, in the seventh month came and the sons of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. And then Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, and his brothers, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brothers, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they set up the altar on its foundation, for they were terrified because of the peoples of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. They celebrated the Feast of Booths, as it is written, and offered the fixed number of burnt offerings daily according to the ordinance as each day required. And afterward, there was a continual burnt offering, also for the new moons and for all the fixed festivals of the Lord that were consecrated, and from everyone who offered a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and to the Tyrians to bring cedar wood from Lebanon to the sea at Joppa, according to the permission they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Okay. Then there's kind of this... uh, a little bit of the structural parallel that you see in uh, Ezra 2 and Nehemiah 7. And I noted before, Ezra 2, it's that long list of names and the numbers that go next to it. Nehemiah 7, the same long list of names and numbers next to it. Some of the numbers are different. But then after both of those chapters, the very first thing that gets said in Ezra 3 and Nehemiah 8, respectively, is that the people gather together as one man in Jerusalem in the seventh month. So here's all the people, and they gather together as one man for a purpose. I'm sorry? 
They were unified. That's basically what the idea of them coming together as one man means. They were unified. Um, and so we have Jeshua, which is an alternate spelling of Joshua, the son of Josedek, which is an alternate spelling of Jehozadak. Uh, Jeshua arises with the priests and Zerubbabel, and they rebuild the altar. When Abram first entered the promised land, way back in Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, first thing Abraham did when he got to the promised land was what? Anybody remember? He, he built an altar to sacrifice to the Lord. That was the first thing Abraham did when he came to the promised land. Genesis 12, verse 7. Now the people are kind of following in the footsteps of Abraham. They get back to the promised land. First thing they do, they build an altar. They build an altar to God. And the people, uh, they, set, they set up this altar so that they can offer the regular burnt offerings. The law of Moses actually instructed the Israelites to offer two burnt offerings a day. Uh, one in the morning, one in the evening. They would sacrifice a lamb without blemish and they would do this as a constant double daily ritual. In uh, Exodus 29 talks about it. Numbers 28 talks about it. There were more offerings that they were supposed to make too. Like on the Sabbath, you had to offer double. Uh, at the beginning of every month, you had to offer extra things. On the feast days, like the Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles, you had to offer a bunch of extra stuff. Uh, and I'm not going to get into all the specifics of that calendar here. The main thing that's going on here is they set this altar up so they can offer these sacrifices on it. And verse 3 said something I thought was very odd. And they set up the altar on its foundation, for they were terrified because of the peoples of the land. What's the deal with that? Why? What does them being terrified have to do with the construction of the altar? Yes. Uh-huh. Right. Correct. Yes. Uh, and they're rebuilding the temple as a whole on its old site, too, for that matter. Um, you know, then the idea here is that, you know, I mean, you have Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple's been knocked down. They're rebuilding it on the same spot, uh, with the altar on the same spot and everything else in the same spot. Yeah. That's an interesting question. Why, why, why would that make them afraid, I wonder? Hmm. What? Yeah. If... Yeah. They're afraid of the people. So it's like their, their, their fear prompts, they respond. And I think there's a couple different ways that people have looked at this. You know, some people have argued that you know, well, they didn't build the whole temple at once. They just built the altar because they were afraid. But the more positive way of reading it is that they afraid of the people of the land. How do we solve this fear? By worshiping God, by building the altar where God meets with us. And so it's ultimately their fear of the inhabitants of the land. Who's going to protect us from these people? We'd better be getting on God's good side. We'd better be trying to worship the God of heaven. And that to me, seems to be the more likely option here. Um, that, that they're Now, a little bit later on in chapter 4, their fear of the foreign people is actually going to stop the construction on the temple. And that's not going to be such a great thing. Uh, so fear, fear can be a powerful motivator for good or for ill. So that's the, that's the thing we sometimes look at. You know, and we sometimes forget. Some people think that all fear is bad. That's not true. Fear can be a good thing. Fear can be a bad thing. It depends on the context in which it appears. When Israel was on Mount Sin- was at Mount Sinai and God spoke to them the Ten Commandments and the people were afraid and Moses shows up and he says, don't be afraid. God has just said this so you will fear Him. Don't, don't fear. God said this so you will fear. That, that seems a little bit contradictory. But in fact, the, the whole point is that you, know, you need to check your motivation for fear. What are you really afraid of? Are you afraid of the decibel level? Are you afraid of the, the fire and the terror? You know, where you should be fearing the God behind all of that and having reverence for God. And there's a sense, of course, you know, in which they really should fear God and not so much the inhabitants of the land. But we're going we're gonna to get to the problem with that in chapter 4. They celebrate the Feast of Booths in verse 4. What was the Feast of Booths? What was that? Hmm? 
verse 4, it goes by, it's, it's sometimes translated different ways. Feast of booths, feast of shelters, feast of tabernacles. Does anybody else, what version, what, are, what does everybody's version have here? I'm just curious. Shelters. Booths. Well, you're reading the same version I'm reading. Tabernacles. Yeah, the different things. All means the same thing. Basically, you know, tents. You know, we build these little temporary shelters for ourselves. What was the point of the Feast of Shelters or the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles? Yes, it was to remember the wilderness wandering. In the Law of Moses, they were instructed to go and get these branches and leaves and all these other things and kind of construct these little temporary shelters for themselves and effectively camp out in their backyard, I guess. And uh, they would remember the time that they had spent in the wilderness together. Uh, Now, how good were they about actually keeping that feast? Well, not so well in their history. And this is, in fact, uh, becomes an issue a little bit later on. Because in Nehemiah chapter 8, in verse 17, and this is chronologically much later, this statement gets made. uh, That's Ezra 8. Nehemiah 8. In Nehemiah chapter 8, in verse, seven, uh, in verse 17, under the oversight of Ezra and Nehemiah, it says that the entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them. The sons of Israel had indeed not done so from the days of Joshua the son of Nun to that day. And there was great rejoicing. So, Nehemiah 8, uh, the events of Nehemiah 8 take place a good 50, 60 years after what we're reading here. And it says that they hadn't been keeping the Feast of Booths like this since the days of Joshua the son of Nun. Now you know Joshua the son of Nun, that's way back. So what do we do with Ezra 3 where they celebrate the Feast of Booths? What is that? What's the deal with that? We find a contradiction in the Bible? Is that what's going on here? Well, what do we do with that? They either did or they didn't. Alright, well, I mean... Yeah. Okay, so here, here's kind of the reconciliation here. The emphasis in Nehemiah chapter 8 appears to be on the actual fact that they got the leaves, they got the branches, they built the temporary shelters for themselves. Uh, they do not appear to have been doing that. They appear to have been celebrating a feast, sure. They've been doing something. They appear to have been offering a lot of sacrifices. In fact, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles has more sacrifices associated with it than any other feast. To give you an idea, in Numbers chapter 29, it says that, okay, so you had to offer 14 lambs every single day for a burnt offering. And it's an eight-day feast, so you can start doing the math in your head. Two rams every day for a burnt offering. One goat each day for a sin offering. And then, and this is where it gets complicated... 13 bulls minus 1 for each successive day of the feast. So 13 bulls on the first day, 12 bulls on the second day, 11 bulls on the third day, all the way down to the eighth day. Uh, And then plus, of course, all the regular grain and drink offerings that have to go with that, and all of the regular two lambs for the daily offering that are anyway, which means you're really offering 16 lambs every day. And uh, plus a few other things. The total comes out to a whopping 215 sacrifices during the week. And they may have been doing that... But in Nehemiah 8, they're reading the law and they come across this passage that says you were supposed to build these temporary shelters for yourself. And they go, we haven't done that. And we haven't even done that since the days of Joshua the son of Nun. They're in, you see an instance where we've been doing it a certain way, but then we read the scripture and it said we're supposed to do it a different way and we haven't been doing that. You know, well, what's the solution? To say, well, our, our ancestors had this all figured out. They must have known they didn't need to do that. No, the people change their minds and they, they, they change their practices and they go back to doing what the scripture says. Uh, so, I mean, that's the basic idea here. It's not, Nehemiah 8 not saying so much that they've never celebrated the Feast of Booths, but they never did it correctly. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's made out of leaves. It's not going to, it's not going to last forever. Or on their rooftop, even. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of like you're not living in your house for eight days. You're living in this little hut 
made out of makeshift hut for eight days. Again, to remind yourself of your wilderness experience. You know, I mean, presumably, I guess they just take it down afterwards. Um, yeah, it's a. Big, You know, I mean, it's a good question to uh, ask. Uh, you know, I mean, what, so, what what is interesting about this, of course, is most the temple, the temple, even in even in the days of Solomon, they're said to have offered the sacrifices for the Feast of Booths in Second Chronicles eight thirteen. So, you know, you have that as well. But and while the temple has been following the sacrificial rules, the temple's been keeping the calendar in numbers. The people have not been observing the personal ritual for the Feast of Booths, which, by the way, isn't mentioned until you get to Deuteronomy. And this is probably because most people who study the law give up before they reach Deuteronomy, so they never read that part. That's what's really going on here. Um, Gotta read your Deuteronomy. It's good for you. Alright, so the Feast of Booths is significant in a lot of places. It's significant in the prophet Zechariah. It's significant in the time of Jesus. And similar to the comment in Joash's reign, uh, during the reign of Joash, sorry, not Joash, during the reign of Josiah, a remark gets made, they've never celebrated the Passover from the days of the judges until that point. Which, of course, ignores the part where Hezekiah celebrated the Passover, too. Uh, there was, it was a belated Passover. It wasn't on the correct month. But it was observed in the reign of Hezekiah. And they, they did have to kind of bend the rules a little bit for unclean people. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of like that one in Hezekiah's day doesn't really count. It's the one in Josiah's day we're counting. Um... And even though, again, the sacrificial calendar seems to have been followed pretty rigorously. So anyway, all that aside, so they set up the altar, and they used the altar for burnt offerings, not just for one feast, but for the new moon, and for all the fixed festivals, verse 5, uh, that the Lord consecrated, from everyone who offered a free will offering to the Lord. Uh, yes. Yes. That's a good question. The new moon celebration is the thing that happened. The new moon marks the beginning of the month. And there were extra sacrifices at the beginning of every month. It's not talked about much in the law, and so it sometimes gets overlooked. But it is brought up in Numbers chapter 28. Uh, Numbers 28... In verse, starting in verse 11, at the beginning of each of your months, you shall present a burnt offering to the Lord, two bulls and one ram, seven male lambs, one year old without defect, three tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering for each bull, two tenths of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering for the one ram, a tenth of an ephah of fine flour, etc., etc. It gives a long list of sacrifices that they were to offer on the first of every month. And since the Jews followed a lunar calendar, the first of the month would be the new moon. Uh, the New Moon festivals are alluded to elsewhere in the history books. Uh, for instance, in uh, 1 Samuel, it's noted that Saul was holding a New Moon festival and David doesn't show up. It's all part of this big test that David and Jonathan have for Saul to figure out if Saul really hates David, you know, how he reacts to David being missing. But it's a New Moon festival that that happens at. It's the first of every month. And the prophets talk about it some too, I think. Uh, I think Amos makes reference to it in... Uh, I want to say Amos 5, Amos 6, something like that. Anyway, that's what the New Moon Festival was. It was just an observance at the beginning of every month to kind of offer some extra sacrifices. And I guess they would, even though the, the law never tells them to feast on that day, they still feast on that day. That's interesting. Hmm. Uh, all right, so they set up the altar, all the fixed festivals, um, and it's used for free will offerings because you're never limited to a specific subset of sacrifices. You're allowed to offer as many sacrifices as you need to. And verse 6, perhaps, and most important point to make here is that they offer the sacrifices without a temple. There's no temple. They haven't even laid the foundation yet, according to this. But they're still offering sacrifices. Which is more important, having the practice of worship or having the building for it? Having the practice of it, exactly. You've got to choose between them. You've got to choose, which one am I going to set up first? I'll set up the altar first. You know, the, the, the building, the, the, the structure, that comes later. Um, the, the, there's, so there's, got, there's a priority being set here. You know. Yeah, it does take a while to build the temple. It takes a really long time for them to build the temple because uh, it gets dera- the effort gets derailed, as we're going to see uh, in chapter 4. But that's something to keep in mind. 
Uh, verse 7, they give money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar wood from Lebanon to the sea at Joppa according to the permission that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Uh, so they're paying Sidon and Tyre to get cedar wood from Lebanon. And now we're going to start to see the first of a series of echoes from when they first built the temple. I mean, the first time the temple was built, I maybe uh, look at this passage in Chronicles. I'm going to make comparisons with Chronicles more than Kings because uh, it's likely that Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah are following the same, kind of the same thematic emphasis, we might say. Also, we didn't study Chronicles. We studied Kings here, so try to get us on the other side of the book a little bit. In 2 Chronicles chapter 2, uh, in verse 7, Solomon says, Now send me skilled man to work in gold, silver, brass, and iron, in purple, crimson, and violet fabrics, who knows how to make engravings, to work with the skilled men whom I have in Judah and Jerusalem, whom David my father provided. Send me also cedar, cypress, and algum timber, uh, algum timber from Lebanon. For I know that your servants know how to cut timber of Lebanon. Indeed, my servants will work with your servants to prepare timber in abundance for me, for the house which I am about to build will be great and wonderful. Now behold, I will give to your servants the woodsmen who cut the timber, 20,000 cores of crushed wheat, 20,000 cores of barley, 20,000 baths of wine, and 20,000 baths of oil. Then Huram, king of Tyre, answered in the letter sent to Solomon, Because the Lord loves his people, he has made you king over them. Huram continued, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has made heaven and earth, who has given King David a wise son endowed with discretion and understanding, who will build a house for the Lord and a royal palace for himself. Now I am sending Huram Abi, a skilled man, endowed with understanding, the son of a Danite woman, an Atyrian father, who knows how to work in gold, silver, bronze, iron, stone, and wood, and in purple, violet, linen, and crimson fabrics, and who knows how to make all kinds of engravings and to execute any design which may be assigned to him to work with your skilled men and with those of my lord David your father. Now then let my lord send to his servants wheat and barley, oil and wine, of which he has spoken. We will cut whatever timber you need from Lebanon, bring it to you on rafts by sea to Joppa, so that you may carry it up to Jerusalem. Now you look at that and compare that with what we saw in Ezra. You're hiring skilled craftsmen from Tyre and Sidon. You're paying wages to the Sidonians. There's a comment made that nobody cuts timber like they do. And the wood is going to be sent down... uh, It's basically going to be stuck in the water and floated down all the way to the port in Joppa. And so it's kind of... They're kind of trying to get you to think about what happened in the time of Solomon. Is this temple going to be like the one that Solomon built? Will the temple have the former glory of the one that Solomon built? Uh, Well, there's a few differences we're going to start to see. And one of the first differences comes out in verse 7. The project is endorsed not by the Judean king like Solomon, but rather the foreign king Cyrus. Uh, It says according to the permission that they had from Cyrus king of Persia at the end of verse 7. Anybody have a different word other than permission there? Uh, Chapter 3 verse 7. Ezra. Uh, Some have suggested that it's not just... The ESV I think says grant. Hmm? Oh, it says grant. Yeah, the idea of grant... You know, is the per- I mean, because the permission to buy materials would hardly need specifying. Somebody has made the point that you know it's not just permission, it's an actual financial grant to help them get the materials in the first place. Um, which appears to have been in addition to the contributions of Ezra 2. Uh, in Ezra 2, at the end of the chapter, it's mentioned that they gave, according to their ability, the treasury for the work. Also, you have the Isaiah's comment in Isaiah 60 that foreigners would contribute to the rebuilding of the house. In Isaiah 60, in verses 11 through 13, the prophet writes, Your gates will be open continually. They will not be closed by day or night, so that men may bring to you the wealth of nations, with the kings led in the procession. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish, and the nations will be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the box tree, and the cypress together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I shall make the place of my feet glorious. Uh, so th- this idea here is you know, that the, the, the reconstruction of the temple is going to be contributed in some way to by these boring nations. Although, Isaiah 60, Isaiah 60 in general talks a lot about foreigners bringing the wealth of nations to the holy city to kind of uh, contribute to its building up. Um, it's, 
It's very interesting because, um, you know, there, there's a there's a common tradition associated with the the birth of Jesus, where oh, the wise men that came to Jesus and they give them gold and frankincense and myrrh. Well, there's a very common tradition associated with that that oh, those guys were kings. And where in the world did that idea come from? Was it just something that people pulled off the top of their head? No, it's actually not. It's, it's taken from Isaiah 60 in verse 3 where it talks about nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. And then it goes on to talk about how these kings are going to bring you the wealth of nations. In verse 6, they're going to bring you gold and frankincense. And you see oh, why people would have immediately seen that and connected that with the Jesus story in Matthew chapter 2 and all that other stuff. So that's... Random trivia fact that has nothing to do with Ezra study. But, um, anywho, Ezra chapter 3, uh, not only have they built the altar, they also rebuild the foundation of the temple. Yes, you have something. Yes. 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 Yeah, you better, you better... Right, yeah, and that, that point has been... Uh, right, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yeah. Ask your neighbors, they'll give you silver and gold. You know, so he's talking about the neighboring nations helping out. Uh, also, I, I don't think I mentioned... I'm, meant to mention that. I don't know why I didn't. It slipped my mind. In Ezra chapter 6, uh, again, Darius makes the kind of the same point. Um, that he issues a decree in uh, verse 8 that what you're going to do for the elders of Judah in rebuilding of the house of God, the full cost is to be paid to these people from the royal treasury out of the taxes of the provinces beyond the river and that without delay. Uh, kind of one of the funnier reversals in the Bible. We're trying to snitch out the people, get them to stop building the temple, and the king writes back and says, all right, I did the research you told me, and you're right. We did. We do have to rebuild the temple, and you're going to pay for it. <laughs> uh, whoops. <laughs> so that, that, that's going to that's gonna come up in chapter 6, and 5 and 6, really. Um, picking up in verse 8 of chapter 3, in the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Josedek, and the rest of their brothers, the priests and the Levites, and all who came from the captivity to Jerusalem, began the work and appointed the Levites from twenty years old and older to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers stood united with Kadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, and the sons of Hinnadad with their sons and brothers of the Levites to oversee the workmen in the temple of God. Now, when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. They sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Yet, many of the priests and Levites and the heads of the fathers' households, the old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people. But the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. Ah, we're going to get to that. <laughs> we're going we're to get to the weeping in a, in a, in a minute. Um, okay, so in the second year, second month since they arrived, uh, the second month would have been the month after Passover. Solomon's temple was also begun in the month after Passover in 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1. Zerubbabel and Jeshua has, and everybody else starts the work. And, you know, so here we have kind of this interesting uh, setup here. The Levites are appointed to oversee the work from age 20 and up. Interesting people at the age of 20 are seen as qualified for an overseeing slash managerial position like this. Uh, Jeshua is united with Kadmiel and many others to oversee the workmen. Kadmiel was a Levite, and in fact his name is often listed after Jeshua's in these uh, various passages. And then uh, in verses 10 and 11 we have a celebration. 
The foundation is laid. The priests and the Levites and the sons of Asaph praise Yahweh with trumpets and cymbals. Um, you'll notice the comment in verse 10, it's according to the directions of King David. Um, this is kind of a similarity. You know, Sometimes they say according to the law of Moses. Here it's according to what David said because David himself was acting on God's instruction as God's messenger when he told them to do these kinds of stuff. And the song that they sing, give thanks to Yahweh for He is good for His loving kindness is upon Israel forever. Now that's a song that you, that's a line that you hear a lot in the Psalms. But it's also more importantly to our context what they sang when they were building the first temple and when they dedicated the first temple. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5, Oh no, David's like, David's like several hundred years in the past. Uh, yeah, David's like several hundred years in the past. David's like 1,000, 1000 BC in that range, and Cyrus is like, well, where um, Cyrus comes to power in 539 BC. So we're, you know, we got to go several, we got to go almost 500 years back to get to David. Um, yeah, no, what they're talking about when they talk about according to the command of King David, they're talking about like the traditions that David set up all that time ago when they, David and Solomon, kind of them building that first temple. Um, in Second Chronicles chapter five and verse thirteen, uh, mentions how in unison the trumpeters, the singers were made to, uh, were to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and glorify the Lord. When they lifted up their voice, accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and when they praised the Lord, saying, "He indeed is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting," then the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Again in Second Chronicles 7 and verse 3, all the sons of Israel seeing the fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped and gave praise to the Lord saying, truly He is good, truly His loving kindness is everlasting. Now here in Ezra, the same thing gets said, give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And... But we also have weeping. Verses 12 and 13. There's a lot of priests present, heads of households, elderly folks, older men. They remember the temple of Solomon. And, these are, and we're not talking like infant children that remember the temple. No. Uh, you know, It's been about 50-ish years since the temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. And so what we've got here are people who, if they were in their 20s when the temple was destroyed, then they would be in their 70s now. Well in their lifetime. And the foundation is laid. They shout too. But it's not the shout of joy. It's the shout of weeping. All the shouting is so great, the shout of weeping and the shout of rejoicing cannot be distinguished. Why weep? Why are they weeping? I'm sorry? Remember the other temple being destroyed. Why? I mean, the, the motive for the weeping isn't explicitly explained for us. You know, perhaps, you know, there's some sort of a realization. You know, what did we lose as a result of our apostasy? Um, I imagine, you know, it's a mixture of these old emotions. There's something else to be said here, too. What was the first temple like? Glorious. What is this temple like? How's it going to stack up, huh? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to quite stack up. Um, and you know, they're making a huge effort to make everything the same as before. The materials are taken from the same place, as we've noted. The house is started on the same month. They're singing the same song. But you know, in every story about the dedication of the temple in the Old Testament, the glory of God fills that temple. You don't have that here. And you're not going to get that in Ezra 6 either. And so what we have here is a situation where the people are genuinely frustrated, I guess, by the lack of glory that seems to be taking place here. And the prophet Haggai specifically talks about this in Haggai chapter 2. In Haggai chapter 2, in verse 3, he writes, "...who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now?" 
does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and all you people of the land. Take courage, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and they will come with the wealth of all the nations and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. There's a lot of exhortations. God's prophets are going to make a lot of exhortations like this. Haggai and Zechariah both about the, the problem of underestimating the glory of this new temple. Now granted, the glory of God doesn't fill the temple. There's no ark. There's no abundant gold. There's no Urim and Thummim. There's no sacred fire. And this is the first in many hints in Ezra that eh, something's missing. You know, people's restoration isn't quite complete. Um, and in fact, what we have here is a series of mixed feelings and discontentment and it's going to set the stage for the problems in chapter 4. I mean, how should we view this? We look back on the past, oh, it was just so much better back then than it is right now. Why is it that the past is so much better than right now? Is that a good question to be asking? Is that a good perspective to have? Jen. You know, I mean, you know, well, at least we were worshiping the true God, right? Or who's despised the day of small things, Zechariah asks in Zechariah 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. It says uh, in verse 10, Do not say, Why is it that the former days were better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask about this. There's a warning in Scripture against seeing the past too fondly, looking at the golden age through rose-colored glasses. Because if you're too fixated on how good stuff used to be, what's going to happen? Well, you're probably going to mess up what you're doing right now. More than not. More often than not. Yes, Jen? Oh, yeah, I mean, well, that's, the, that's true. Okay, people who look back on their past and talk about a golden age are frequently distorting that image anyway. You know, it's like... And I mean, I could get into the, the whole host of things where people talk about, oh, things were so... I hear... I've heard brethren, you know, all oh, church was so much better in the 1950s. What? Well, where do you get that idea from? On what basis? You know, there might be things that were, huh? More people in the pews. You know, I mean, I could sit, you know, you had more hypocrites still. You had more hypocrites. You had, you know, I mean, all kinds of stuff going on like that. I mean, I could tell all kinds of... Right, and I think you know that, that's a, that's a that's a big point that comes not just out of Ezra, but out of everybody who's writing during this restoration type period, is that it's not about the numbers, it's not about the the flash, it's not about the, the how much money you spent on the structure, it's about whether or not God has been given the glory that is His due. The people of Israel of the past, yeah, they had a more glorious temple, but you know what else they had? They had a bunch of temples to their idols too. They had a whole heap of apostasy. There was swearing and murder and deception. I mean, they had to reckon with you know, golden calves at Bethel and Dan. They had Baal worship going on prominently in Israel. You want to know something? You don't see that so much in Ezra and Nehemiah's day. So was it better then or is it better now? You know, it's a, there, there's a kind of a flip side to that that needs to be kept in perspective. Sure, you, know, you don't have the wealth and the prosperity that you once did. But you don't have all the baggage that went with it either. Sometimes, sometimes God, well, maybe, you know, sometimes God takes away things because you know we're better off without it, and having stuff ruins us. It really does. It seems to have ruined Israel. You know, the zenith of their of their prosperity was under Solomon. They had so much gold, silver was worthless. But was it really the zenith of their spirituality? Was it really the best time for them, spiritually speaking? Well, I mean, Solomon was pretty corrupt himself. Solomon built shrines to Molech and 
uh, Chemosh and other pagan gods. He wasn't, you know, he took thousands of women as his wives. And Solomon is actually kind of criticized a little bit at the end of Nehemiah even. Um, in, in Nehemiah chapter... In Nehemiah chapter 13, very close to the end of the book, Nehemiah makes a comment about how did not Solomon, the king of Israel, sin regarding these things? He's talking about taking foreign wives. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things? Yet, among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, the foreign women caused even him to sin. Do we then hear about you that you've committed all this great evil by acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? You know, he uses Solomon as a... There's the guy in the past... You're trying to imitate that. Don't. It's a bad idea. There's a sense in which Ezra and Nehemiah is almost about, you know, kind of condemning some of the bad excesses of the Solomonic way. There's something to think about. Alright, so there's got this mixed feelings in chapter 3, and it sets the stage for what happens in chapter 4. In chapter 4, there's going to be a lot of disheartenment, there's going to be a lot of conflict. It comes about in verse 1, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the fathers' households and said to them, Let us build with you, for we, like you, seek your God. We have been sacrificing to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of fathers' households of Israel said to them, You have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God. But we ourselves will together build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. And then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building and hired counselors against them so to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the day rang of Darius, king of Persia. And what happens here? They hear about the temple, they disrupt the building, Zerubbabel won't let them participate, and then they start hiring their legal team to get this temple construction to stop. And it was pretty easy to intimidate this group of people because, well, some of them are already kind of having misgivings. Like, you know, is this temple project even going to be worth it? I mean, the old temple was so much better. This one's just going to be a mess by comparison. I mean, and now the people of the land don't even want us building it. You know, let's just not rock the boat. Let's just not cause trouble. And it was easy to see how they got into that stagnation and how the temple was left desolate for so long, from the reign of Cyrus all the way down to the reign of Darius. Um, and you know, we'll get the, the chronology of the situation here. Where did, I, where did I write down the number? I always forget the dates. All right, so Cyrus ruled until the year 530, before he was killed in battle. Uh, his son Cambyses came to the throne. He ruled for eight years, from 530 to 522, and eventually he died. And his death was kind of suspicious because, uh, you know, some people think he killed himself. Uh, Cambyses didn't have any heirs, so the throne was left to Darius the First, or Darius the Great, as he's sometimes known. Um, he ruled from 522 to 486, and it was at that point that Haggai and Zechariah showed up in the second year of his reign. Uh, so you know, really. You're you're probably looking actually more at about 15 years of the temple being desolate because uh, it's it's not towards the end of Cyrus's reign when all this is going on. Uh, You're probably looking at about 15 years where the temple is left in its desolated state. They didn't apparently. They didn't even they they had the altar and they appear to be using that, but they didn't. The construction just kind of sat there. And, I mean, you you see this all the time. You see a building that's under construction, and then it just sits there for years and years. Uh, There's a building that's just a couple miles away from where I grew up in Altamont. Uh, They were building a skyscraper. Uh, It's been under construction since I was in middle school. And in that... Hmm? Yeah. (laughs) Ten years. No, no, longer. It would be longer than that. I guess we're... It's probably been about... 15, 16 years now, I'd say. That is a great question. Um, and one that's unfortunately going to have to wait till Sunday because we're out of time. <laughs> but that is something we are going to talk about. Uh, why, why, why is it that Zerubbabel won't let these guys help? 
are these guys real? Oh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you right now. And just kind of the short answer is: don't get don't get the impression that oh, we're just these good, sweet people who want to help you at the temple. Get out of here! We don't want you helping. Oh, okay, well, fine. We're going to sue you. No, that's not how it went down, and that, that's not their motivation behind all of this. The fact that they immediately tried to thwart it as soon as they were kind of rebuffed from it, I'll have to kind of hint hint at us that maybe their motives for helping weren't quite as pure as they're trying to present themselves. But we'll say more about that on Sunday morning when we look in detail at chapter 4. Chapter 4 has a lot of confusing chrono- chronology issues with it, uh, but you know, just, uh, I guess, be prepared for that. And we'll pick up chapter 4 on Sunday.